from the Far East, Southeast, all the way to the Indian subcontinent. We speak a hundred different languages, a hundred different dialects. I'm told that in the country of India alone, that they have dozens and dozens of dialects within that one country. So for Main Street, to look at us, we're very complicated. We're just curious. They don't know anything about us. They think they do. Oh, they think Asia is one country. Have you ever been asked that? You know, like, like, what are you? And I guess, well, I'm Japanese American. Oh, yeah. I've been to Korea. It's like, no, I'm not Korean. I, you know, they don't get it. We're mysterious, okay? In 1843, hello, folks, come on down here because I don't have a mic. Welcome. In 1843, this was the first time that Asians actually got on the soils of Hawaii. And the Japanese came as a small group to work in the pineapple fields, in the sugarcane industry, and of course the Chinese and the uh, Koreans followed very shortly. And then, oops, I've done something bad. So then shortly after that, the Asians then moved to mainland, and they went on the west coast of America. And you know, our stories are very, very similar. You can see I'm really IT, you know, challenged here. So then they went to the mainland, thank you so much. They went to the mainland, the Pacific coast. Our stories are so similar. Why did they come to America? Because they were poverty stricken. They were looking for jobs. They were looking to come to America, the land of opportunity. So our stories are similar in that reason. 1848, the gold rush in California. Quickly, the Chinese came. And within a year, they had 1,000 people going to Gongsan the gold mountain. They were going to strike it rich. And primarily, these were Chinese, but the Japanese were also there too. But look, 10 years later, that increased to 37,000 people. And when you bring in a group that large, and because they could tell that we were different. Remember the 35 million European immigrants that I said came here? They couldn't tell. They looked like Americans, but not our grandfathers, not our great-grandfathers. They knew we were different, so it was easy to target us. Hello, ladies. Please come on down. I don't have a mic. Welcome. Look at this. Because of our growing numbers, now we've jumped to 37,000 primarily Chinese immigrants here. Wow. They're looking at us now. You're taking our jobs. You're living off of our land. Think about what has happened recently with the poor Mexican group. Think of all that backlash. You know, they're doing the same thing. Asians were criticized because we did the lowly jobs. We did it for less pay. We did dangerous jobs. We did dirty jobs for less than what Americans would do. But that caused animosity because we're still taking their jobs. So the Californians, very clever. Okay, so if the Chinese and the Japanese are gonna get rich off of our gold mines, we'll slap a foreign miners tax on them. Well then some of the Chinese and Japanese didn't wanna pay, they refused to pay. Okay, what happened to them? They were murdered or they were brutally attacked. Then they were blacklisted. Okay, you will never get a job in America. And then the civil rights violation here that I want you to look at, they could not testify against a white person. So basically, Asians were stuck with, with the rules whatever we got shoved down our throat. Think about it, the Gongsan, the gold, was just about getting depleted and then a new opportunity arose for the Chinese primarily and some other Asian groups. The Transcontinental Railroad. 
First, they welcomed the Chinese into ancient Malaysia. Why? Because you know what? We could give them the dirtiest, we can give them the most dangerous jobs. After all, who is going to volunteer to go inside the mountain and light dynamite and hope that you can run out and not get blown up? So initially, that was great. They had them. But you see how the numbers increased from 1,000 in 1850, then it jumped to 65,000 in 20 years, and in 30 years to 107,000. That's a lot of people, folks. But compared to that 35 million Europeans, nothing. But what? They could see that we were different. And that's why we were such an easy target. That's why we could be hated uh, so easily. The dirtiest, hardest job, look at it. A thousand people dying. 10% of the workers were Chinese or other Asians because they did the most dangerous job. And think about their pay, $28 a month. Maybe back then that was a pretty good salary but not when you compare it to what the European immigrants were making. The Asians got 40% less. Finally, in 1869, the Transcontinental Railroad was completed at Promontory Point in Utah. This is a very famous picture. Why? Because only a handful of Chinese and other Asians were allowed to go to this ceremony and absolutely zero, absolutely zero Asians and Chinese were allowed to be in this very, very important um, picture here. So this is very famous. It's a very hurtful and shameful picture. Okay, you had the gold mine. They're depleted. You had the transcontinental railroad. That's finished. So what are the Chinese and the other Asians going to do for jobs? There's nothing left. So again, the Americans are saying, hmm, all right, we've got to keep them out. They're just gonna keep coming in and coming in. They're gonna take our jobs. They're gonna live off of our land. They're gonna take what's ours. So they passed the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Look at it. It was supposed to be a 10-year act, but it kept getting extended, extended. For six decades, for 60 years, they kept the Chinese out of America. And it was only in 1943 that it was repealed. 60 years, they kept the Chinese out. Okay, we've got the Chinese stopped. They're not gonna be able to come in anymore. So, what do we do with the people that are here? They have no job. And then think about why they don't have a job. They can't even own land. They can't own a house. They can't marry with white people. They are just forbidden, forbidden, forbidden. So what they've done is they've just backed the poor Chinese into these little groups. And there were other Japanese and Koreans that just got into their own community. That was the only way they could make a living. So they had to buy and sell between themselves. That's the only way they could survive. But look at this poverty-stricken area that they lived in and how pathetic it was. But with them being together, then San Francisco is like, hmm, they're an eyesore. Oh my gosh, I know they carry the bubonic plague. So they started this media spin, this scare tactic to make all Americans hate the Chinese even. Look at it, isn't it pathetic? But it was just the way to label the Chinese to get them, to try to get them to go back home. Yeah, right, it was so easy for them to go back home. So what did they do? They came up with ordinances and acts and laws just to put more pressure on the Chinese. Look at this first one. If you're a fisherman, you're gonna get taxed. Remember, European immigrants are not getting taxed on this. Only the Asians, only the Chinese. A police law, it's for your own protection. Yeah, right. The cubic air ordinance, that was so interesting. You had to have 500 cubic feet of airspace. You Georgia Tech engineers can help me with how big that is. But you had to have that much space per person 
in your area where you live. And we saw Chinatown, how that was. It was just another way to squeeze the Chinese, the sidewalk ordinance. You know how the Chinese and even the Japanese would carry things on the poles, you know, the baskets? Not on sidewalks, couldn't do that. The Q ordinance, some of the Chinese were not, allowed, were not able to pay their bills for what they were put in prison. Once they were in those jails, then they said, oh, those Chinese, they have lice and ticks and fleas. So they started shaving off the pigtails, which was a disgrace to the Chinese people. Then look at California's second constitution. It was all there just to protect the Californians and to get rid of those undesirable aliens. And they put laws where corporations couldn't even hire the Chinese. Squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. And then finally, yes, you could fish and eat it, but you couldn't fish and sell it. So that shut down the fish market for the Chinese. Let's move on to the Filipinos. What was happening? At 1902, they had the pensionado program. And if you remember in your world history, 1899 was the Spanish-American War. And at the end of the war, the US took over the Philippines. And this was somewhat good for the Philippines because that way they had a chance to learn English. And under this pensionado program, they were allowed, some of them, to come to the US and study English. Please come in, thank you. So that was good. Predominantly, the Filipinos were Roman Catholic. Again, so they were exposed to a lot of the culture that we have 